which is an indicator for Guillain-Barre syndrome. And I was then admitted to the hospital for treatments. Um, so here's where Guillain-Barre syndrome and GBS left me. I could no longer use my arms, my hands, my legs, or my feet. And I was partially paralyzed. I say partially because some muscle groups still worked. I was still able to kind of control my trunk. I, I still had kind of ab muscles and back muscles. So you could sit me up and I wouldn't fall over. But I had opposites. You know, my biceps wouldn't work at all, but I had some tricep function. And I had quadricep muscles, but my hamstrings didn't work. So all you OTs know, you can't really have one without the other. They equally, they cancel each other out when they're working normally, but you know, if you don't have one, if you have one, you can, well, I'm not sure what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody understands. All right. Uh, I had also lost close to 15 pounds uh, in a matter of the six days that I was in the hospital. The medical treatments that I had um, made me so nauseous that nothing really sounded very good. And in six days, I had a lot of muscle atrophy just because there were no more communications going to those muscles. I, you know, the biceps were pretty much gone. You could put my arm up in a fist and ask me to flex, and all you could feel was bone. And then they'd flip me over onto my, they'd roll me over onto my stomach and ask me to lift my heels uh, to my butt. I just couldn't do it. There was nothing there. And uh, the, one of the biggest things I learned about Guillain-Barre syndrome is uh, gravity is heavy. Um, <laughs> So I'd like to take a couple of minutes just to explain Guillain-Barre syndrome. Some of you may have heard of it, uh, most of you probably have not. Um, most people tend to hear of it when they get their annual flu shot, because in the 70s there was a big swine flu outbreak and a lot of people ended up getting Guillain-Barre syndrome in the 70s. Um, uh, what I can tell you is extremely rare, it's about one to two per 100,000. So I was the lucky one in this instance. <laughs> Uh, so here's the, I'll give you two definitions of Guillain-Barre syndrome, the, the one that I plagiarized from the GBS Foundation's website that the OT people in the room will, will understand, and then I'll give kind of the, the, the way I understand it. So Guillain-Barre syndrome is also called acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. So say that ten times fast. It's an inflammatory disorder of the peripheral nerves, those outside the brain and spinal cord. It's characterized by the rapid onset of weakness and often paralysis in the legs, arms, breathing muscles, and face. The breathing muscles is very important because it basically says if it attacks your breathing muscles and you don't get there in time, it can kill you from suffocation. Um, and also, if you kind of just get there after it started attacking your respiratory system, you're on a ventilator for a period of time and you can't really do much of anything because you're no longer breathing on your own. The way it was explained to me by my neurologist was when I had that what well, was likely swine flu, your body develops antibody, antibodies to fight off viruses. And normally when that virus goes away, the antibodies go with it. Uh, in my case, the antibodies stayed in my, in my system and began attacking my nerves and my nerve endings, damaging them or blocking them from receiving communications. So GBS is diagnosed, um, like I said, on the rapid Ascending weakness, frequently accompanied by abnormal sensations that affect both sides of the body. Similarly, is a common presenting picture, loss of reflexes, such as knee jerks, usually found. To confirm the diagnosis, a lumbar puncture to find elevated fluid protein, an electrical test of the nerve and muscle function are, is performed. Now, when I was undergoing these tests, the knee, the knee jerk and all those reflex tests, I failed all of them. I mean, he was wailing on me. So it is, it's treated in the early stages. Because the progression of the illness is unpredictable, most newly diagnosed patients are hospitalized, placed in intensive care to monitor breathing. Care involves the general supportive measures of the paralyzed patient, and also methods specifically designed to speed recovery, especially for those patients with major problems such as the inability to walk. Plasma exchange or blood cleansing procedure and high-dose intravenous immunoglobulins are often helpful to shorten GBS. Most patients in their early hospital stay and when medically stable are candidates for a rehab program to help learn optimal use of muscle nerve, as nerve supply returns. So basically the, you know, the treatments help get you stable, but there's no real magic 
pill that you can take that's going to help you get better. It's through occupational therapy, physical therapy, learning again. And really the only difference between me and a baby learning how to walk and use their bodies is I already know what's supposed to happen. Uh, but through these repetitive motions, it, your, your brain and your body learn how to do things again. <coughs> the treatment that I received was called IVIG. It's intravenous immunoglobulin. And it's a product, it's a blood product administered intravenously. It contains pooled IgG, immunoglobulin antibody G, extracted from plasma of over a thousand donors. And it can last between two weeks and three months. And it, it works as these immunoglobulins uh, get kind of flooded into the body and they block uh, the bad antibodies from doing any further damage, so you can kind of establish a baseline. Um, kind of a funny moment when I was learning about all of this, uh, this IVIG stuff kind of looks like um, hand sanitizer. It's kind of thick like that. Um, so you feel awful after it goes in. Um, but at one moment, the, uh, the nurse that was hooking me up to it bobbled the glass IVIG bottle. And I couldn't imagine why her face turned white and she was in a panic. And I later found out that each one of these bottles, and I had to have five of them, cost $11,000 a piece. Because of the process that's involved and how many people it takes to make one of these bottles. So it's pretty amazing stuff. Uh, so there I was, uh, you know, a 33-year-old, otherwise healthy husband, father, having the rug completely pulled out from under me, yanked away from my family. I'd gone downhill so fast, that I wasn't so sure that my time on earth was up. I did my best to block that idea out of my head, relying heavily on the words of my neurologist who felt strongly that we had caught it in time. I can't begin to tell you how much my head was spinning and how stressful the situation was for us. And to top it all off, we had just recently found out that my wife Gretchen was pregnant with our second child. So all sorts of questions were going through my head. You know, is this really gonna be temporary? Am I going to be able to provide for my family again? Am I going to always be you know, bound to a wheelchair? Am I going to be able to walk again? How am I going to be able to care for my kids? Um, will I be safe to hold my new baby when he comes? Uh, so that left me with a decision to make. Do I let the diagnosis defeat me? Or do I like, look it square in the eye and say, you're not going to win? All my life I've been involved in sports. In fact, I played collegiate volleyball here at UNH. I've never considered myself